First Peter chapter number four. We have been studying the book of First Peter, and now we have turned the pages and uh, in the last two chapters. Of course, First Peter was written by Peter the apostle, and he would eventually die as being crucified upside down for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was one of the main uh, leaders of the disciples. Peter uh, was the man who was a spokesperson. For, for the people at Pentecost. He also brought Cornelius and opened the door for the Gentiles to come and uh, be received by the Jewish people. James and uh, John were also there. James was the first to die. He would die first as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. John would be the last one to live. He was probably a teenager when chosen to be a disciple. Matter of fact, you can be a disciple for Jesus Christ when you're a child, when you're a teenager. And uh, when you're older or younger, Peter uh, was a fisherman, and of course he was brought to Christ by his brother Andrew, and I, I just thank God for Andrew. Andrew wrote no books of the Bible, no, no sermons are recorded, but he was really good at bringing people to Jesus. And you know, you and I ought to be uh, giving every effort to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ, just like Andrew did. He brought Peter, his brother, to Christ, and God used Peter far more publicly in your, in your way, in the way to help people grow in the Lord and to be used to the Lord. But Andrew will be the, always the one known for bringing him to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Peter is an older man and he has followed the Lord Jesus Christ. He was challenged, if you love me, Peter, then feed my sheep. And he left his fishing boats and his fishing business and began to do what God put him on the planet to do. And that was to feed and pastor people, and he did that very effectively. At the end of his life, he writes these two letters, and I wrote many letters, I'm sure. And by the way, you ought to write letters. You ought to write some notes. You ought to write some letters. Your kids ought to have letters from you. Your spouse ought to have letters from you. Your mom and dad ought to have letters from you. Uh, your brother and sister, it would be good for them to have a letter from you. Uh, new converts ought to have letters from you. I think this is an important thing. It's a lost art today. Now we're sending everybody text and memes, but I think it might be a good idea to just sit down and write a letter to somebody. If a wayward child, write a letter to them. You don't have to write a book to them. Write a letter. Just let them know that you're thinking about them. You're important to you. And much of our Bible are letters that people wrote that God included to put into the Holy Scriptures. And Peter wrote this one. And he definitely covers the gamut of different things. He talks about salvation in chapter 1. He talks about the Scriptures or the Word of God and the value of the Scriptures in the life of an individual. He talks about being clean and set apart, sanctified for God. He talks about being separated to God from the world in this passage. But there are definitely two main things, and one of those is submission. The other one is suffering. Most of us, we don't like those two concepts. Submitting, coming underneath the authority of another. And suffering, going through difficult times. It's a challenge for us. But that was one of his themes in the book of First, First uh, Peter that he spoke about. Submitting to our government authorities and the ordinance of men. Submitting in our, in our workplaces. Submitting to our, 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 our authorities in our life and especially unto the Lord. Even submitting to the lost, un unsaved people that need somebody to yield to the Lord so that they can be helped. Now we find, he says, uh, he speaks of suffering, going through difficult times. Of course, Nero, a young leader of Rome, would eventually be responsible for taking the life of Paul and probably Peter in some way. Uh, he, he didn't live to be very old. He was raised by his mother and really had no warrior experience. He had no battles to fight. He tried to build some buildings out on the coast. It kind of made him more popular. But he had a real distinct hatred for Christians for Christianity, anyone who followed Christ. And he attempted to kill them and was very successful. And it was a difficult time to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. And Peter knew it and referenced it several times. He said, they're going to speak evil of you. Matter of fact, about eight times in the book of 1 Peter, he speaks about that people are going to be slandered who do nothing but believe that Jesus is God and try to follow him. That's all they believe, and they're, because of that, they're centered. We live in a day and age where people believe that, that uh, society would be much better if you did not have the religious right. People who believe the Bible, who believe Christianity, they want a society that would get rid of them. They could have what they want with no, uh, no protest and no someone barking about uh, immorality or the wrong things that want to be done. Even in the World Olympics, 
They made specifically uh, a mockery of the person of Jesus Christ. They didn't approach Allah. They didn't approach Buddha. They didn't approach India. They made sure that the world, uh, while the world was watching, they could personally mock the precious person of the Lord Jesus Christ and his truth. That's nothing new. I don't like it, but it has gone on since there was time and since there was Jesus. He's always been a mockery. He's always been uh, a problem. I remember years ago as a young pastor getting ready to pray in a city council in Long Beach, California. And I was asked to come pray, and so I went to pray. And a guy tapped me on the shoulder. He said, remember, there's a name that's pretty offensive down here. Make sure you don't mention him. And I thought, what do you mean? You're asking a Christian pastor to come pray, and he can't pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? I did pray in the name of Jesus Christ, and I didn't get asked back to come back again after that either. But that's all right. It's just, a, it's just an amazing thing. But we find here, uh, Peter says, look, uh, it's not going to be an easy time. Every Christian, anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer some persecution. Most of it will be slanderous, and then some of it will be violent. Some of it will be very, very, uh, very uh, challenged by the courts of laws and by the, the powers that be. But let's look and see what the Bible tells us about that. We're looking at chapter 4, verse number 1. Can we look at that, please? For as much then as Christ, once again, he is the topic of chapter 3 at the conclusion there. It's Christ that has gone into heaven, verse 22, and is on the right hand of God, and angels and authorities and powers being subject to him. So he's speaking of, of the fact that Jesus didn't come. He did nothing but good and got nothing but evil. They, 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 they tortured him. I always will wonder why. There was such animosity toward him. I, I wanna, if I were representing Jesus, I'd say, what did he do? What did he do? He fed you? He healed your sick? What did he do that, that caused you to have such anger, to crucify him, to kill him, to be so emphatic that he has to be done away with? Well, it's just the way it is. And he says, now Jesus suffered. And you and I are going to go through the trials of life. Look at verse number one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, he suffered while he was in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind or the same mentality. He said, if Jesus didn't have a, a, a cakewalk coming to the earth, do you think you're supposed to have a cakewalk? No, he said, you need to take on a warfare mentality to understand that it goes with the territory. It is much easier to live a nominal Christianity than it is to live a fervent Christian life. Society does not care. The devil does not care, in my opinion, if you just live a worldly Christian life. But the tables turn drastically whenever you t intensely try to please the Lord Jesus with your life. You're going to enter a battlefield that you've never been exposed to. The old preacher, Lester Olaf, it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. So run if you want to, run if you will. But he said, I came here to stay. And it's not going to be what Daniel, you think of Daniel. He didn't. He lived in, in Babylon from the time he was a teenager till into his 90s. And at the, in his 80s and 90s, he was thrown into the lion's den. He did nothing but pray. That's what he did. He prayed. And they caught him praying, and they took him into the lion's den. You think about Joseph in Potiphar's house. He did nothing but serve Joseph, jo uh, serve Potiphar. Potiphar said, hey, he didn't think about anything because Joseph did such a good job taking care of him. But because he would not bow to the lustful uh, desires of Potiphar's wife, he uh, was, was sent to prison where he would spend the next several years of his life as a young man in his prime of his life sitting in a, in a prison cell, twiddling his thumbs and serving prison meals. Things just don't, doesn't hardly make sense. The disciples, all they did was went and told folks about Christ. They didn't revolt against the government. They submitted to the government. They paid their taxes. They, they served in the capacity they were supposed to serve in. And yet, any time it came to you, you could see persecution take place. It goes with the territory. He said, if you, if we have a Jesus who suffered and went through some difficult times on this earth, you and I need to arm ourselves with the same mentality that your battle, your walk will not be a walk in the park. It won't be as easy as, now, if you want to just be a worldly Christian, it's not going to be that difficult. You'll regret it one day, 
But if you really want to be fervent for the Lord, you're going to, you're going to attract satanic opposition and societal opposition as well. Look at the next verse. The Bible tells us, be of the same mind that he that suffered in flesh has ceased from sin. Now suffering doesn't make you stop sinning, but it does change your perspective. When people are in pain, when people are being persecuted, when difficult times, trials are coming, it instantly changes your perspective. About four things. We'll talk about that in a moment. Look at verse number two. That he, the person that's going through a difficult time or going through the trials of life because he's a Christian, would no longer live the rest of his what? Time. Now, time is a major topic of the Bible. Now, there'll be, a, there'll be in the future a time when time is no more, when it's not time. We live everything with, with the clock. Some of you are watching the clock right now. You're like saying, man, every time I swallow, my stomach says thank you, and I hope he finishes up this message in a hurry. We're thinking about the time. We're thinking about, oh, I got to go home and watch the Bears lose. And, uh, <laughs> nah, I'm just joking. The Bears. All right. Hey, we're thinking about what's going on. We're, we're thinking about time. And we, we think about it. He said, but this guy, the child of God who's trying to live a fervent life, he is reconciled in his mind. You know, I'm not going to use the rest of my time fulfilling the lust of the flesh, but doing the will of God from the heart. Listen, friend, you have to decide what you're going to do with your time, and I have to decide with what I'm going to do with my time. And let me just ask you, how much time do you have left? You don't know. I don't know. How much time I have left. But this guy, who is going through a difficult time, has the example of Jesus to think about, and he has his own perspectives to say, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my time? He decided he was not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means he wasn't going to do whatever he thought would be a good idea to do. But he would do the will of God. You know, the happiest people in this room and in any sector of society are children of God who do the will of God. Find out what the will of God is to do for you and do it. I'm talking about the will of God is simple. It's not complicated. It's really making sure that souls around you hear the gospel. It's making sure that you're sanctified, you're clean and ready to be used of God. It's making sure that you're separated to God, not conformed to this world. It's making sure that you're submitted to God's Holy Spirit and His direction in your life. And it's making sure that you're thankful. In everything, give thanks. For this is the... Boy, I tell you what, I almost want to put that first. Many people are miserable because they think they deserve more than they got. They think they need a better husband, a better wife. They need a better home, a better place, a better car, better relation. They, and they're miserable thinking about all the things they don't have at the expense of all the things they do have that they're not expressing gratitude for. He said, that guy is going to do the will of God. Look at verse number three, if you would, please. For the time past in our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. And he says, Peter is talking to a primarily a Jewish audience. And he says, look. As we review the way we used to live, we lived like Gentiles live. And basically, he's thinking of pagans who practice selfish and immoral, sensual, sexual lifestyles. It was all about them. It was all about the party. It was all about the, the immorality. And he goes on to describe, he says, as we, as we reflect back upon the way the unsaved people live, we should repudiate it. We should repent of it. And we should walk differently than they, than they live. Look, if you would please, as he describes it. Verse number three, once again, for the time was past in our life may suffice to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, just the way they, when they walked in lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is really immoral ways. Lust, doing whatever they want to do, desiring to have things that they want. Excess of wine revelings, the party, banqueting, the party life, immoral. These are oftentimes referring to the pagan orgies of the days and the drunken orgies and immorality. By the way, alcohol, intoxicants, drugs, and immorality, they go hand in hand. God help us when we think, well, we can handle it. 
Let me tell you something that's going to throw you into a tailspin of immorality and all kinds of problems that come from that. They go hand in hand. Verse number four, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, that you don't party with them like you used to. And what, as a result of that, what's the last three words there? Speaking what? There's four words, I'm sorry. <laughs> Speaking evil of you. You know, it's, it's amazing that people don't bat twice about, bat their eye about people who, who, are, who are just destroying their life on alcohol, drugs, and partying, immorality, just cre creating a train wreck of a life. But then have someone get right with God and leave all that stuff, and now all of a sudden, People are speaking negative about them because they don't run with them anymore. The old friends, hey, come on, come party with us. No, I'm not doing that. Oh, you're better than us. You're a holy Joe. You're a Billy Bible. You want to run? You don't want to run with us anymore? You don't want to be a friend of us anymore? You don't partake with us anymore? They speak evil of you. Look at the next verse, if we can, please. Verse number five. Who shall give an account of him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? He said, just keep in mind that there is someone that is judging the quick and the dead. Now, when you see the word quick in your King James Bible, it means those who are alive, who have everlasting life. When you get saved, you are quickened by the Holy Spirit. You're made alive to live forever with God. The dead are people that are not saved. They have chosen not to receive Jesus as their Savior. They've gone another direction. That's why the Bible tells you in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14, and the Bible says, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. People who died without Christ and those who were in hell without him, they were now put into a place called the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life, that's the book of the new birth. That's the people who have been quickened, who've made alive through the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, there are two judgments awaiting mankind. And you will be at one of the two. Let me just remind you what they are. He said, by the way, when we're looking at it, we're living our life, the rest of our time, whatever you're going to do with the rest of your time, he wants you to consider judgment. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it's appointed to every man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Okay, one thing God wants all of us to know, and you already know it, and the Spirit of God will remind you. Matter of fact, he is here in this room right now reminding every one of us of three things. Our sin, the righteousness we need in Jesus, and judgment to come. You're gonna, you, you and I, every human being, every road of life leads to God. I don't care what your paradigm is. The Bible's very clear. Every knee will bow before God. You can say, well, I'm not going to do it. Your arms are too short to box with God. He's already figured that out already. And he says, you're going to be in judgment in one of two places. There's two judgment appearances. One is for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you're not, you've not yet had a spiritual birthday, you've not yet been quickened by the Holy Spirit of God, uh, don't let pride and procrastination keep you from doing that. That's called the judgment seat of Christ. That is where people go to be evaluated by God who are saved who have been forgiven by the Lord, who have got, who've been born again, who have already been made quick. The other judgment is called the great white throne judgment. That's found at the last pages of our Bible in the book of the Revelation. This is where mankind will, figure, will, will assemble before God. And this time is because they have not put their faith in Christ. This one takes place a thousand years after this one. This one over here, whenever one day you're going to die or one day the Lord's going to come for us. When he comes for us, there are seven years of turmoil upon this world and there are seven years of a celebration in heaven. During that celebration will be, I believe, the, the judgment seat of Christ. Now here, people are not judged for their sin because anyone who truly gets saved, their sins have been put on the person of Jesus Christ. He took your sin for you. The Bible tells it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. And God made Jesus to be sin for us, who himself, he knew no sin, that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. See, everybody who goes to the judgment seat of Christ is not judged for their sin, but they are evaluated 
for what they did with the rest of their time. What they did, how they served, what they did, how they sacrificed, how they gave, how they forgave, what they did with their schedule, what they did with their finances, what they did for the cause of Christ. When they prayed, when they witnessed, when they read their Bible, all of that will be there. You're not going to be punished for your sin, but you'll be rewarded for your works. Or you'll lose reward, and you'll find out about it right there. The other judgment is the judgment, the great white throne judgment. And now here, the books are open. And these are all people who have not been forgiven. They've chosen to take the religious route to forgiveness versus the relationship with Jesus. They've chosen to earn their way to heaven and not receive his gift of eternal life. Their name is not in the book of life, but all their sins are written in a book. And they'll be judged out of the things written in that book that all their sins are going to be there. Friend, let me just tell you, if you're here today, don't go to this judgment. There's two ways you're going to exit this world with your sin and you'll get a fair trial at the, judgment seat, at the great white throne judgment from a God who knows everything about you. And you can go, to, you, can go into, you can die with your sin or you can die with God's son. And there you get a free pardon covered by the righteousness of Jesus. You're going to a judgment but you're not going to be judged for your sin. You'll be judged for your service. Be judged for your love. You'll be judged for your commitment. Or over here, you'll be judged for your sin. Everyone here goes to the lake of fire. Every single one. No one there goes to the lake of fire. Everyone there has an eternal life with God because they've exchanged their sin for God's Son. You know, I want to conclude our message today. In this passage of Scripture, the topic is trials. And trials should make you consider four things. Number one, sin. Sin complicates life. And it should give you an attitude of a militant, aggressive approach to sin. I'm not going to live this way. This is not pleasing to the Lord. I do not want to live the rest of my life living a sinful existence. I would say, secondly, trials give you a different perspective on time. On time. How much time do you... A wise, mature person understands that life is but a vapor. It appears for a little time and then quickly goes away. And when you look at, when you look at uh, trials, you should say, you know what? I don't want to be... I, don't, I want to be militant against sin. I want to be careful with my time. I want to be patient with the unsaved. How many remember when you were an idiot in the world? Living the way the world lives. Well, guess what? There's a few other idiots who haven't come to Jesus yet. We ought to be patient and loving. And, I, and please forgive me, I'm just joking about the idiot stuff. I'm an idiot myself. I'm a blooming idiot. <laughs> I'm the flower of my family. All right. But you know, the truth of the matter is, we live unsaved. We should not live unsaved, but we should have patience with those who live that way and love them to the person of Jesus Christ. We should be focused upon the person of Jesus. For as much then as Christ suffered, we should take on the same mentality as the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we should be fervently, while trials should cause us to be outward focused and now inward focus. You know, no, no matter what you're going through, there's someone who has it worse than you with a less help than you'll have. And you need to say, you know what, Lord, how can you use this trial to help me help somebody else? Because there is a judgment to come. Trials should cause us to think about sin and to be, have a middle, an attitude of militant uh, aggression against it. It should help me to con consecrate on my time, focus upon my Savior, and look forward to his coming. And then it should remind me that I do have an evaluation. Can I just say in closing, you can't make a new beginning, but you can make a new ending. You see, my marriage is really struggling. You can't make a new beginning of your marriage, but you can make a new ending. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. 
Say, Pastor, I've made a mess of myself. Let me tell you something. You have a God who loves you and wants to help you today. And the future is as bright as the promises of God if we'll trust him and love him. Let's pray together, can we?